now uh to continue with our discussion as we discussed the last time uh we are going to look at the research methodology and the, in passing um let's come up with the outline first in any research methodology we must be able to have what is called uh, the study setting uh, as a section and then we must be able to have a research design okay and then number three we must be able to define our population uh, which is called study population and the number d we can be able to actually explain uh, the sample and the uh, sampling procedures uh, that we are, we are we are following uh, to actually uh, determine our results and then we can actually come up with the, even the sample size and the uh, after determining the sample size then uh, we must be able to look at the uh, data collection instruments uh, that can be used uh, to actually <laughs> get uh, information and then uh, thereafter we can be able to talk of uh, sample size okay i've already mentioned and then uh, uh, like uh, analytical uh, procedures uh, which is actually the method of analysis and then uh, after that we can be able to explain uh, as a section which is always important variable uh, definitions and measure variable definition and measure and then uh, i we can be able uh, sometimes to explain the issues of uh, data quality and uh, finally uh, we talk of issues of uh, ethical uh, consideration ethical consideration so these are some of the core important points that uh, we normally uh, must be able to master them as we are doing it now in terms of the study setting uh, you must be able to describe the place uh, uh, geographically as to where your study is going to take place so uh, this is uh, like the geographical description of uh, this place where your study uh, took place and the, in this case you must be able to explain uh, what is the social economic situation uh, of the area what is it that makes people uh, earn a living and the uh, on average how many people are in the area just on average and then under the research design this is where we normally can be able to describe our research as either um, uh, qualitative uh, uh, or quantitative or sometimes you can be able to say this one is a primary study uh, or it can be a secondary study okay or it can be a cross-sectional study or it can be a longitudinal study cross-sectional longitudinal or sometimes people can actually go this is going to be a time series uh, analysis so uh, we must be able to understand the difference between a cross-sectional and longitudinal which i want each one of you to go on youtube find out what is a cross-sectional study what is a longitudinal study what is a primary study what is a secondary study what is a qualitative study what are the quantitative studies what about the time series uh, studies and the, uh, the other one we can call them as the exploratory okay design okay you want to explore certain things uh, sometimes we can call that one as experimental design so we can actually do uh, things from an experiment perspective okay and the uh, so all these ones they actually can explain the different types of research designs that are there that you can actually use as a, as a scholar so i want you to take time to go through these and understand how they actually uh, can be applicable and while you are thinking of that uh, you should be able to put your study in context is it um, a qualitative is it a quantitative is it a mix of the two is it a cross-sectional is it a longitudinal is it a time series is it an exploratory is it an experimental so that when you are putting up a statement of the research design you should be able to define and qualify your studies very well now on the study population uh, uh, this is where a lot of students they actually make a mistake 
So if you say smallholder farmers who are in a banana, okay? So in this case, your study population is any farmer who is doing banana. But because you cannot look at any farmer who is doing banana, then you can be able to create a sample. Okay? Okay, you can create a sample. So in this case, uh, uh, at, at, uh, you, are, you can actually have like a highlight. Eh? Here we have got a small holder farmer. Uh, any total small holder farmer can be, is called your study population. It means that in that area, anyone who is a small holder farmer is your study population. But uh, those ones that are clustered in the banana industry, those ones can be your sample population. Can be your sample population. Sample population means the population where you can sample your data from. So normally, it is like a sample population over total population. It gives you a probability, P, which is actually very much importantly used. So for example, you can have total number of smallholder farmers. They can be 3,000. But out of these 3,000 farmers, only 1,000 farmers are in banana. So in, in that particular way, you can actually now take a proportion of 1 over 3. It means that in the area, 1 over 3 uh, of the farmer is a, somebody who is growing banana. So that's actually how you can be able to take note of that. Now, in the instance that you don't know the study population, then P will make up a 50%. So I'm a color 0 0.5. So I want you to understand properly on how we are transisting to, de to classify the proportion here of our interest. So the study population must be defined and you must be able to explain the attributes uh, even of those particular farmers. So you must be able to know what kind of attributes are they having and then put those particular attributes so that people can understand and uh, having done that uh, then uh, you, you you talk of now sampling so we have got different types of sampling techniques but in, on the overarching part we have got the uh, probability sampling and the uh, non-probability sampling now under the probability sampling uh, we have got the uh, uh, different types of uh, uh, methods that can be uh, under that particular section one of which it can be a simple uh, random sampling or it can be systematic random sampling or it can be stratified random sampling or it can be cluster random sampling so i want you to take note and go through again either on youtube try to understand what each method is we cannot have more extensive time to discuss them in more detail but i want you to to check what is a simple what is a simple random sampling when is it used what is a systematic sampling when is it used what is a stratified sampling when is it used what is a cluster sampling when is it used at the end of the day i want you to make now a determination as to which sampling you are using in your study so it is recommended to use either one or a combination of as many so that you can actually come up with the exact sample uh, which you can easily draw your inferences from to answer your research question. So it is not uh, like uh, 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 just choosing anything, but it must be able to support the inferences that you want to make in that uh, study. So uh, on the other part, we have got a non-probability uh, sampling. Now, non-probability sampling, we have got a uh, quarter sampling and we have got a purposive sampling and we have got a, uh, uh, what we call volunteer, volunteer sampling. Under volunteer sampling, we have got what is called uh, a snowball sampling and the, we have got the other one which is called self-reflection sampling self reflection sampling and then the other one we have got what is called a a ham facade a ham facade uh, sampling technique now a ham facade sampling technique 
this is actually the technique that you actually use when you just want to have certain things done to suit your interest. Uh, that is why convenient sampling, it is part and parcel of that. So I want you at the same time to look at how these ones can be applied in context. So you should check quarter sampling, purposive sampling, snowball, safe reflection, and the convenient sampling. So this type of sampling, if you can check, they are non-probabilistic because to volunteer, you cannot give probability, convenient, purpose, quota. So it's like they are in a certain confined environment, which I want you to understand uh, in that particular part. And mostly, these are used uh, to support uh, qualitative analysis or qualitative study, qualitative, qualitatively designed study, and these are meant to support quantitatively designed study. So these are the two scenarios that we must be able to take note of. And uh, 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 lastly, I want us to look at uh, the sampling procedure. A sampling procedure, it is actually a systematic process that you can be able to explain in your analysis as to how you can actually identify the respondent of interest. Sometimes we actually call that one as a, a sampling frame. It is called a sampling frame. Sampling frame. Sampling frame. Okay, it is called a sampling frame. So it's so much somebody can should be able to trace how each and every respondent has been identified. That is why I am giving you um, like a, a statement to say, for example, in a systematic uh, 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 sampling, how can you classify a sampling frame? Or in a random sampling, what kind of a sampling frame are you going to follow? So uh, it's, it's a connection. You cannot be talking of this without a sampling frame being explained. So each and every sampling, you must have a sub B to explain a sampling frame so that things are added up properly and they are more comprehensive in the context. That's the most important part uh, to actually uh, consider. And uh, on the other part, I want us to conclude by looking at uh, uh, now, uh, anyway, we are going to continue in the next section because of the uh, saving uh, issues.